So first of all, a um, huge thank you to everyone for the table and delighted to have the turnout. Um, my name is Sarah Joyce and I'm the fifth stock manager. Um, delighted to be here today in collaboration with TPSA. Hi everyone, I'm Connor, I'm the auditor of TPSA, it's here at the Physics Student Association. And I'm happy to invite everyone here for, I suppose, a bit of a landmark moment for TPSA where we have our first call from the professor. So I'd like to welcome Professor Martin Hess of the Quantum Lab of here in the School of Physics. Well, thanks very much. Thanks very much for the invitation. If this is not loud enough, then just tell me. I'll try to uh, work as much as possible that you can all understand. I wanted to start today's talk with a little bit like an introductory page. I will be talking about physics, about active quantum nanophotonics. And some of you, or perhaps most of you, may not have heard of what that actually could mean. Well, we're working on it, because many of the things that we want to do within that, we are still discovering. But let me start perhaps a little bit at the beginning, and by ways of introduction, well, that's me. I think should have been taken a couple of years ago, not that many of us. And I just wanted to tell you who I am. Uh, being a professor here at Trinity, usually, and the reason you haven't seen me for a while is that I'm rather new to Trinity. Rather new means that if we take off that time that COVID has given us that time to keep away somewhere from the background, I just officially started here just in 2019. But then COVID told us to stay home. And for that reason, many of you may not have seen me yet. But I do have even a background to that before I came here. And uh, if you want to know how does one become a professor, how does one know and how does one advance, this is a very, very brief sketch and all looks like laid out. One thing I can say about that, uh, and maybe I don't have to do this at the very moment, but the different steps that we have in here, they had I known here that I would have ended up here, probably would have been quite an interesting story. Anyways, so what did I do? Uh, back then I studied physics, uh, bachelor and master's, because at that time it wasn't called both master's and bachelor's. I did this uh, mostly in, in Germany, in the hotel, in North, Southern, Germany, Franconia, and in Berlin. The PhD then I went to Scotland, and so, although I worked for the PhD there, I was one of these European programs presented the thesis itself in Berlin then, and then was in a typical kind of Central European German way how to become a professor. I did another thesis. This after about five years after the normal PhD, uh, you have to sit down and write another little booklet of some stuff that you've done during that time in order to get the qualification to become or apply for a professorship. So you have to show that you actually not only do this research and science, but also part of teaching. And after that, I uh, got a uh, offer for a first professorship at the University of Surrey in southern, the south of, south of London in the UK. I moved on then to Imperial College in London. I still have a very small affiliation with Imperial because having recently moved there, there's one or two students that are sort of finishing there and a project to finish up. But my main focus, I'm here now, I have to finish it. In the meantime, I've also been in other places in the world, because one of the things that science is, is incredibly international. Not everyone has probably moved about as much as I did, but uh, usually every place that you are gives you something. And one of the things that I'm proud about is that everywhere where I am, I've taken something that has enriched me, but on the other hand, I think I've also enriched the places I've like a give and take of these things. So I've spent some time in Stanford, in California, close to San Francisco. Lovely place at the University of Munich. It was just there on a temporary basis as well as you do uh, before you become a proper professor. We tried to do this for a while and then I had a long-standing affiliation of temporary. Many of you might not know where that is, but that's in Finland. A very interesting place to be. Okay, I'm not doing my research alone. There's a group. And this is a picture being taken at the Imperial, at the physics department there, just before COVID struck. You see me sitting there, some of the people here, 
the way we look now is like that. So it's a little bit like a, a variation in where we, where, we, where we go by. This was taken uh, about two weeks ago. Well, and you can see some of the guys, this from me for example, India, he's there as well. Well, we changed it because his hair is not. <laughs> but then uh, my hair always grows as well, so I just make sure that whenever a picture is taken, it has its proper thing in there. But there's a couple of people who have moved with me and some new people on there. The other thing I also want to say, it's all teamwork. Whatever I'd like to go and tell you around and, and present today is really something we're working together. And this working together is such that, and thanks very much for the insight from the theoretical physics perspective, we are theorists, stroke computational scientists. And in physics, we act in a particular case that's a little bit like, I explain this to people like architects. We want to build a building, we design it, this is what we do, we design materials, we design the environments, and we investigate these processes, and we try to learn from those. But then we need people to actually make the building, make the experiment. And we collaborate incredibly closely with a large group of people. And these collaborations, they're vital. They're vital from both ends, they're vital for us, because we have to know if we want to design our simulations, if we want to design our theory. We want to make sure that it's relevant and that we're linked up to what reality is. Experimentalists, on the other hand, very often they wouldn't, they wouldn't know where to go without us. It's a bit, bit uh, say, sometimes they do. And then they come to us asking, I've never something there, I don't know what it is. So it's sometimes the foresight, sometimes the aftersight in the role that we play in forming that theme. So all those experiments that I'm going to be discussing today, they're performed and it's a key collaboration with the University of Cambridge in, uh, well, German numbers or Sherman's group. This is the you know, we see it's very interdisciplinary, what we do. And Ricardo Sapienza is uh, still one of my colleagues at Imperial. Luigi Wang in Nanyang University, that's in Singapore. We don't, we'll see why Singapore is has some uh, quite important links that we follow up with. Here at Trinity, one of the people I've collaborated a lot with is John Donovan's group here. But actually, first group, and then a very important one as well, we call it here. I may have forgotten to another one, but this is the main collaboration. Okay, so what do we do when we work here? We do have our theory, and this is incredibly busy. It's way too busy, and even though I've loaded that talk today, and there will be, I promise that will come to a certain point, I will just not continue. It's always challenging for professor to stop talking. But on the other hand, uh, you, you, uh, I, these are a couple of these things that we at the moment look at. We combine, and we'll see this in a, in a number of times, we combine special types of materials, metamaterials, with what photons do. The, on the nanoscale. So this link of inventing new materials, using those to promote very particular types of physics is our main theme. We want to allow that to happen, and we also want to understand this. For me, it's one of the important things to do, the understanding of physics. And in this kind of broad overview from quantum nanoscale on metamaterials to laser dynamics, I want to diving into all of those today. So what I want to do is in particular focus on some of those properties. And some of them are linked to what is really at very small scales, linked with photons, and to do and focus something on what is called strong complex. We'll see what that really means. And then we can also briefly discuss what we're going to be using that. I will uh, stay on this one here. Because Time reasons, I will then uh, see what we use with this sort of near field, what we do with quantum things, and then move on to quite a nice element of what lasers do. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Actually, let's start at a very small scale. I would like to go and, and start at something that looks rather costly, I would have thought. What this picture shows is like a gold sphere. These are supposed to be a picture of depictions of gold atoms. 
well, you can see the shine told me. And these are at a certain distance from a plane of other coordinates. So something round or roundish and something flat. The special thing about that is, is their size, or rather smallness. Because the size of what we want to be looking at is the whole sphere here is just about 50 nanometers in diameter. Incredibly small. Nanometers is the wavelength of light is and see these zeros here, this is what we correctly spelled them out. Uh, uh, is there. And what is even more special about this is, is how small the distance between that whole sphere and this plane here is. The way that this distance is kept because these spheres they don't hover in air is by a bit of a magic from the chemical side. By designing a molecule, this is what the chemists do, that holds that sphere up. And in that sphere, you can go and see something to work with. So I'll come to that in a moment. The reason for going to these small scales is because as these small scales can actually have quantum effects and put them at work. And these quantum effects are due to the fact that we can actually get light to these small scales is because we use a particular aspect of what metals can do and light. What about that? You may think about metals with all sorts of consequences, but a very important one is that they contain a lot of electrons. And these electrons are more or less freely moving. As a result of that, if I have a wave, an optical wave here, for this kind of oscillatory wave, this is just a cartoon here. What happens to the electrons in that sphere is they start walking. They start waving about. And if you have, remember, electrons are charged particles. If charged particles wave about, they create, on extremely small scales, they create fields. So they create a kind of optical response through their movement within that container that, again, can then be seen as a field which is radiated off that. So we have something quite special. We can get that little metal particle to behave in a very different way. And you can see that the way that it behaves in a very different way is because we have these oscillating electrons. If we now change the shape of that metal bit, and changing the shape of that metal bit is quite dramatic. If we now make it longer rather than the circular bit, the response, which is now the Light that went off the other one. It's not easy to use this for you. Uh, to, to, to go off that one here, this elongated one here, has a different color from the ones that have these different sizes. So the remarkable bit is we can change colors by changing the shape. And that's an amazing principle by which we can actually now work. We can do that, and people have done it for ages. This is one of these. Uh, ways where they, perhaps knowing, well, not knowing what they've been doing, they put tiny metallic particles in glass and create dramatic, very beautiful visual effects. Something that you can see, for example, in one of the colleges in, in Cambridge. You can also see this in France and Notre Dame Church. So the cathedral there is the summit as well. The other thing you can do is again, a little cartoon here. If you place one metal close to another metal, the way that the, they jointly respond to the light is again changed. And that's what this depiction will be having here, this nanoparticle mirror actually does. So this is one of the principles by which we, we now can control light. And you might rightfully question how do you get light into this tiny one nanometer cap? It's exactly because the light doesn't go in there alone, it goes in through the sort of plasmonic oscillation. Plasmons means that sea of electrons that lives about. Okay. Why do we want to do this? Because at those scales, we want to open up how light and matter and show their quantum face. People have discussed this. And you may have seen this picture before. Almost 100 years ago. At that time, they were completely puzzled. They were puzzled because Suddenly they found that the physics that they knew before, you know that story, if you study quantum physics, 
we know that it is puzzling. And the reason that they wanted to have that do puzzling world is because they couldn't explain things anymore that they've seen as well. What we want to, and this really is almost like a poster book of famous researchers in that very conference. Here, Schrodinger, he gives name to the place here, and I think it's a really beautiful mark that we can always say that one of the pioneers, the giants of quantum physics, actually had a lot to do with here with here to start. But people are interested now in quantum physics because they want to do more. But they don't want to do literally the opposite. They want to not use the quantum physics world to explain what they experimentally observe, but they want to create an environment that maintains and changes these quantum fields. That's what that race, this popularity in quantum dynamics is all about, because about 20 years ago, Chapel Shore predicted that if you were to apply a supposedly quantum computer, could do a lot of the algorithmic side of computations much faster, much more efficient than you would ever else be doing. The essence of the short algorithm is something like a Fourier transfer. But I don't want to get into that now. I just would like to say that computer here, which is now 2019, is here from BBC, also from the Irish Times, they all felt this is something they need to talk about. What they have to report about is this new type of processor. And this new type of processor is an interactive thing that uses quantum effects. Now, what is this thing based on? You may have read the article, or some of these articles on that. And if you've discovered what they are work on, well, they will work on a thing called a qubit, a quantum bit. And that qubit needs to be realized. How does physics realize a quantum bit? The way that it's a, a, a table of how particular systems can be made such that we can actually realize a quantum dynamics. Well, the way that they did this in this Google version, IBM is a similar thing, is based on the so-called Joseph's conjunction. This Joseph conjunction has a group of errors and a I don't want to go into detail on that at the moment, but it makes sure that the quantum interaction between the two level system is there. But there's other ways. This way that this chip works needs a very, very particular environment. The takeaway message from this is a quantum computer is an immensely big thing. You need very low temperatures for Kelvin. Cryogenic environments will do to maintain and in particular shield these processors from any detrimental effects that will otherwise come out. But that's not the only system. What we would like to focus on in the, in the following, and I'll, start, and I'll tell you why we're actually doing this, is there's different realizations where these quantum systems can actually be created. I think most of you have seen it with other systems. It's our toy model for so many things we have one energetic level and another energetic level. If you say, what is up with an excited state and a ground state, ground state and excited state, well, then you can also you can get this in a particular way. You can also create a quantum interaction. And that's what we're actually doing. If we now place a molecule in this tiny gap, we can create inside of that molecule, and we do this correctly, something like a two-level system, and that two-level system here in this very schematic depiction is a lower energy level and a higher energy level with all the complicated otherwise energy levels. If I do this correctly, it would be quite something odd. So what do, why do I want to do this? Well, if we normally look at light, if we now think about that two-level system, you see that there's an energy gap from here to there, a photon with that energy gap will lift the excitation from the lower level to the upper level, and we can go and have that dropping down by emitting the photon. So this, if plotted in a different way, we could use the chalk here, uh, the energy versus frequency. You can see that here the atom has exactly that energy, um, and, and here the photon we have a different dependence on. It's the energy that we have. Okay. 
So if we now have where the case where they interact in a particular way, they would normally meet but not too much room in them. And in the case where, for example, they would have states by which they would not just interact, but do what is called strongly couple with another. Something very strange happens. What started as an atom in the way becomes like light. What started as light becomes like an atom. And that's a very peculiar thing. Because that's what you need if you have a quantum information embedded in an atom that you want to convey on light, because light is incredibly good at conveying information. You can see me now because light travels. That's one of the things where you want to maintain information on the quantum scale. So how do we do this? How do we make that? Then I'll come back to that physical realization. In order to get that strongly coupled state, we need to do something very special. We need to make sure that whatever, again, our two-level system here interacts very, very strongly with the light. And the way to do this is to make sure that the light stays where the atom is. Normally people put this like that. They put things into a cavity. And the cavity is another word for where light can be contained in. And this cavity now, you can characterize it with a certain amount of light that gets out of it, that leaves it by whatever means. And that is proportional to the quality of the cavity itself. The other thing that characterizes that interaction is sort of internal losses. But in order to have that strong coupling, we need to be better, bigger in the coupling between light and matter. We just describe this by G for now. Better than all the other losses in the system. We can take the route of making the cavity as good as possible, which is what some people did for ages. And we can also take another one that we will take in a moment to make the cavity as small as possible. We actually have already taken it. But let's see how that works. And I'll be very quick after that. I'll show you then how that actually comes about. Because if we now plot this quality factor, you remember, the higher that factor is, the smaller that loss. So the higher I make, or the better quality I make, the more I contain the light inside of the cavity. And if I make a structure here, that is, for example, here, this is what people did for a long time. They, they created them and contained the light in there. But there was a problem. Atoms at room temperature fluctuate. Now let's think if this is frequency here. And if I'm emitting at a particular frequency, this is what atoms do. If I have a single atom, they emit at mostly one frequency. Then this is that frequency where they emit. It's a bit broad, and, but let's see, like my hand. If I have a very, very resonant cavity, then the cavity is also very resonant, like the word says. But if the atom fluctuates, that resonance it doesn't overlap anymore. So the only thing that I can do is, again, cool the system to cryogenic temperature so that this atom doesn't fluctuate anymore. If I now do the, and take the opposite route, if I now take and use the fact, remember what the other thing was? If we have a very small cavity, then we can get away with less quality factor and if the quality factor is lower, the resonance is almost like that. It's broader. So whenever this fluctuation fluctuates, it still has that resonance because I don't have this type of system anymore. So I can now afford to make that quantum process work at room temperature when the fluctu where the fluctuations work. And that trick by having that at these very, very small scales allows us now to actually take that big, huge step from cryogenic temperatures to room temperature. We don't have our quantum processors yet, but we are on the way because what we have in here, in this tiny gap, which means nanotechnology and photonics can then open up quantum processes on scales that otherwise would only be exhibited in these cryogenic temperature domains. So that's literally what that cavity here, it's open, but it contains that molecule and as a result of that we 
this is now an experimental plot and we literally designed that here back then is a couple of years ago and this was for us a revolutionary step forward to demonstrate that this strong coupling event where light and matter work together actually was possible on these room temperature scales rather than at cryogenic temperatures. How do we theoretically describe all of that? This is now for the theoretical physicists of you. If I want to do this, I need to go and go back to Maxwell's equations and I need to resolve Maxwell's equations in space and in time. This is what Maxwell's equations do. And then I need to go and link that to equa equations that, describes, that describe the material in which, we are, in which we work. The simplest way of doing this for the electrons is to use a so-called Druder model. This is very, very quick. You can ask me later questions if you like, if you want to know more about that. It just resolves in a way in this kind of... Those of you with eagle eyes can see that this is a little bit like a harmonic oscillator equation for the response of the material, the polarization in that. That's what the field drives. So we can describe that and then we set out and, and do whatever we do in theory. We, we set down in a Hamiltonian. There's an old saying that, show me your Hamiltonian and I'll tell you who you are. <laughs> so in a question like if you can encode that Hamiltonian, it tells you what type of interaction you're taking into account. Here in this case, uh, the, the, the fact is that it's a very simple one, and this is now schematically only. This is what you would normally study in quantum optics. You would see a two-level system here with excitation rates and fields that a wave function describes here, how that works, and we have uh, certain uh, values by, by which we do this with uh, dynamical equations starting here. I'm not going to go into details. You'll see that later. It's Either you know that because you've taken a quantum optics course. If you don't, I don't unfortunately have the time to explain, but I'll try to explain what it means. So if we go by with this, we then create, and this is where we're actually aiming for, this oscillatory frequency here, which is called the Rabi frequency. And that Rabi frequency is that guy that then shows up later. We'll see that in a moment. What we then have to do, we have to describe and set up a so-called density matrix. And that density matrix, if you remember that we were, for simplicity, thinking about a two-level system. We have on the diagonal here elements here something like how many, how what is the excitation in the upper, in the lower, or in the a, a lower level. And on the off diagonal, we have something quite peculiar. We have the dipoles in that. The dipole is literally the response of the system. And we have to do a little bit more about that because this is like what you find if you call the Maxwell Bloch equations in textbooks. They're all good, but there's one problem. People, and remember we wanted to go to extremely small scales, about a factor of 100 at least, smaller than the wavelength. They've always assumed something like that that if this is the, an optical wave, they always assumed this is the so-called slowly varying amplitude. There's that part which, does, which, which only moves slowly in space or in time. It's convenient because you could factor off anything fastly oscillating down there. But that doesn't work anymore if you're on the nanoscale. The reason that it doesn't work anymore is because the scale is so small and you have changing fields on such small scales so that you have to change that now. So this is what is not in textbooks. You have to change these Maxwell Bloch equations to a form which is good for the nanoscale. And then you can augment it a bit. You can create a four level system to it and then it looks beautifully complex. Again, just look at it now. It's uh, for you just to see there's an equation behind what the simulation can show. And if you then put that and use this for a computer, you can then, like in an experiment, you can predict something that the experimentalists cannot see. What you can predict here is that oscillation for a plasmonic system. We've taken all the plasmons into account, the, what, does, what the molecule does, and voila, we see something which isn't quite what the textbooks say, 
because the textbooks predict that here the light changes into matter and, ma and then again into light. Matter changes into light and then this kind of oscillatory thing happens in there. And the description that I usually take in that, take a cup of tea, put some milk in. What happens? They mix. But you wouldn't expect these, the milk and the tea to demix. But that's precisely what is happening here. They retain their information, their coherence, so they get from one end of the system into that mixed state or into the state and go back to the other, a little bit like that. And that's what you need if you want to retain that. And then the fact that we are here in this mixing state it really shows us that we have that opportunity to transform that in, well, up to a certain number of femtoseconds in here. And the reason, and the reason for saying that this is actually very, very good at doing that and that we have to do this is because we want to create that quantum interaction along that line. And there's another reason. Uh, there's, again, our enemy out there, the, you have to think there's continuous interactions with the quantum vac vacuum in there. So you find little tiny elements where the wave, well, that os oscillation is not quite true. It gets kind of kicked about and these happen and there, we can't do anything about those. But what we can do is we can make everything that we want to do faster before anything bad happens. And that's the other principle that helps us. So that's that route where we, where we wanted to, to go down with. Okay. We can also control that a little bit better. And I'll be very, very quick now because I want to also show a little bit about the second part of what we, what we, what we do here is we can also drive that interaction here, for example, with electrons. If this is now again, a little bit difficult to t detect again, a molecule in here and a gold sphere, a gold, a gold surface, we can excite whatever plasmons there are in there with a passing electron or electron beam. And we can then change uh, not only the so-called bright light states, but also dark light states. And I'll be going over those way too fast now. The, the reason what I wanted to show with, the, with this is, is that through that, and this is quite an interesting bit, we can have an ultra fast response, but we can also control that to a certain degree. Okay. Molecules. Molecules are tiny, but molecules are also very volatile. And if we embed them into the, in this other big molecule, which is the, the thing that maintained the distance in the first place, we have a chance to keep them there where they are. But the other element is we can also use condensed matter structures. And this are so-called quantum dots. And that quantum dot is, well, it's a collection of atoms but it also has energy levels. And these energy levels are quite unique. And this is like, and I'm fortunate enough to be, have, have been part of two of the three experiments where a strong coupling at room temperature has been observed. So what we did there, which is now collaboration with the Würzburg group, we used a quantum dot and used a kind of scanning electron, a uh, scanning, uh, scanning microscope this is a gap of only four nanometers to get in close contact with that quantum dot. So if we have that, this is now here a scale of 10 nanometers, we have a tiny, tiny slit and that contains the field at a certain point. Okay, so what can you do with this? Well, you can move across a sample where you have these quantum dots embedded in. That's a different type of material called PMMA. And if you do that, you can see that if you are at a certain position, you get closer to the quantum dot, you can see these kind of ripples coming about again. And the interesting aspect on that was, is that these ripples in this case, maybe you can see that the, that moment, the red bit, by the way, is the theory and the gray bits are the experiment. We were extremely happy that this was so closely coincident with another. But what we hadn't expected is this kind of fact that there is now four ripples in there. Again, a bit of theory, again, very quick. In this case, it shows that 
that light thing in there, a so-called exciton, an, exc an excitation in the system, has the normal type of exciton. This is a bright exciton. You can discover like a two-level system here. But there's another one. And that one is here a so-called charged exciton. It's a, of a different nature. And these two, they work together next to the dark states by which they literally can't be coupled. And again, there's the famous Hamiltonian up there that describes how they interact with light. You put that into play and use a so-called quantum theory. We did here, in this case, approach, we could compute that spectrum. And an incredible coincidence with the experiment uh, it shows that actually that's the physics occurring in there. And again, again, tell that's the role of theory in this case. The experimental exper experimentalists measure these curves. But then as a theoretician, you then have to find an, an interpretation of what is being done in that case. As that, there was another effect coming in there. And again, it's just a little bit like pictures, because it shows that not only the type of excitation that we have in there, but also the internal structure can matter in these plasmonic systems. Normally, you have, in many of these quantum dots, you have energetic levels like that. They can be rather close, actually. And you, and you can deliberately have some where these are very close, but in normal resonators, somehow that resonator here will pick one of these levels and interact with. That's the normal case. What happens in this case here is because they are so close, they're almost like being together first before they interact. Hmm. Why does this matter? OK. It matters because it strengthens that interaction. Again, this is not trivial. The theory behind that is described uh, literally here. If you want, that is more or less in that publication here. Why does this matter? OK, a bit busy, I'm, and I'm, I'm going to be quick here. Normally, we have the two systems here. We have one energetic interaction of the atom, and we have one of the resonator. Why do we need this? Because in quantum optics, for example, if you, have, if you think you have one photon in there, you can also have a second photon, and then you can have a nonlinearity. You can have switching in that in the quantum optics case. Often, this is a very weak effect. So people then came and said, OK, let's just not use a single atom. Let's use many atoms. This is so-called here. And the model is, is that if we have many atoms that are all the same but interact with that, they interact with that system. But the problem is they literally add up on that. But the problem is they don't have this aharmonic or uh, anti an harmonic spectrum, but rather a harmonic one where you can't have nonlinear effects with a single photon. So what that newly discovered root is, is almost like having not, you need one atom to have a quantum interaction with one resonator. If you have many of them, you kind of lose that quantum information, roughly speaking. But now if you use many levels in one quantum dot, you could almost turn on the turbo. It's a bit like having those of you who still have or remember diesel cars before turbos were there. It's really like a slow motion thing. Then you have the turbo, and it's supercharged. And this is a little, little bit like what happens here. You use the same principle but to use the many elements in there in, in order to work together on that. And this was the other bit that, uh, that we, we have in there. And I'm not, not discussing these results again because of time reasons. They're all in here, very recent publication where we, where we discuss that theory behind it. And we're now seeking to uh, um, kind of build on that as well. OK. So with that in mind, we recently also used that principle of having a near field, again, without cavity, to, to go and not only 
drive the emission of this. This is something that we discovered on that with, with two quantum dots, but also to use these two quantum dots and, and here have a, in, in case before we, sorry, use the two as depicted here, if we, if we use both, of, if we use the emission of one of them, we can enhance that to create that single photon that we need later on. It's a bit like having a photon on demand with a quantum property. And here we have the others. But we can also link into how one of these quantum dots interacts with another quantum dot in a so-called entangled way. And this quantum entanglement is now the information where one, where one creates that. And the way to do this is busy principle here is by, is by looking into how that oscillatory mode comes about in that. Okay, so what did I do so far? And I promised to, to show something about the other element as well. So I have to do a little bit more on that now. So what did I try to, to do a little bit like a halfway wrap up? It's more than half in time. We show that strong coupling that where light and matter interact can be propelled to room temperature if we get the physics right. And we're really thrilled about what that can do. For example, we can use that in order to do quantum sensing in biological environments. We've had some protocols because cells live at room temperature rather than cryo temperatures. But then in the last part, after using that near field quantum dynamics, I'd like to go and, and take a step to something that is very well known, which is a laser. OK, let's go back to what we have in here. Two-level system. The two-level system is really like a model for a lot of things. It has we have kind of absorp absorptive processes and spontaneous emission. But spontaneous emission is a bit like that. We climb up that beautiful tower and we, do, and we then do a daredevil jump and jump off that tower. If a lot of people jump off that tower, but don't do this, do this in a, well, do this in a normal way. Well, then, this is like spontaneous jumping off that tower. If by whatever means, I now have a synchronized dive, that is a little bit like the way that if I was to be excited on that upper level, I can have a different type of emission for the light that is then emitted from the system, triggered by one and another. And that's what literally happens in lasers. In lasers, you have a gain material, and you add that gain material into a cavity. Again, a cavity. This is something that provides feedback. It provides whatever photon that is emitted from that gain, feeds it back, and by that feedback, it can trigger the emission of exactly the same one. That's the lasing principle. Light, laser. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So we stimulate that emission. And a semiconductor laser, this is a historic picture, was literally a piece of semiconductor where you could add a current to, and then it generated a light that was emitted. So that light would, in this case, if I was to plot these are picoseconds here, the, the intensity, it would, you would have to pump in carriers in this thing for a while. And after a while, if you have enough of those, you would trigger a burst, and then you would oscillate for a bit and then relax down to a continuous wave. That laser here wouldn't work for the first hmm, five nanoseconds. It would oscillate and only then it's continuous wave. This is what that picture literally shows. Okay, so at the beginning we have these two different uh, elements interacting. However, if that laser now was a little bit bigger this is now the cavity. What comes out at the sides is very different. You could see that suddenly along that lateral direction, this transverse direction, filaments have formed. These streaky things that came about that were here moving about rather than being stable, they were shifting. And as a result, that light that was emitted from that laser was nothing but stable, kept on being unstable. So the laser property actually was completely lost. And this is a historical picture for myself. 
because students like, like you, this is something that I did through my own PhD. People thought this was a, this was a um, steady process. They saw the filaments, but I thought, no, 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 there's, if you look at the physics, there's something dynamic underlying the whole process. So these simulations that we I then started, well, that kind of depicted here, we published that later in, in uh, 96. Luckily, I was able to, this was my first postdoc, to team up with a PhD student uh, to measure them. I can convince the group that it would be a good thing to measure them. This was not a trivial measurement at all. It was a so-called street camera measurement because you had to measure resolving space and time. These are micrometers and these are nanoseconds. So we're a bit larger than these nanoscales, but we have a spatial temporal interaction in that case. And we, this was with another postdoc and PhD student of mine, we later summarized that in a book. That's what we, or we, where we kind of discussed this. Well, people saw that and they knew if they wanted to go and use lasers that were big because there was more power that they could emit, they had to remain and do something special about those. And we recently refocused on this, and this is now a collaboration with Hui Kao's group in Yale. The physics is still like it was a number of years ago. You can still see these filaments emerging now here, flipped by 90 degrees, time running this way and space running this way. Literally, a long time is what, if you have the emission here, what comes out here, what you measure along that direction in this case. So what is happening in there? I need to really be a bit quicker I, because I was encouraged to so sh show some theory. I will be now flipping through that. There's a whole element of theory behind that. Literally, it means like using a similar principle, how light and matter interacts, but now taking on board what semiconductors are. And semiconductors are not trivial. Actually, they're rather interesting and there's several levels of what you can describe them with and what kind of beams you have for time reasons. I want to show you the results. You have an, a, a wave equation that you then use as a modeling basis. And again, the Hamiltonian, very sorry for being so fast. It's not the ignorance, it's just the time here because all of these beautiful processes that these here uh, show up, uh, they have physics underlying that. So once you take that interaction of light and these electrons with Coulomb, they interact with another and they interact also with the phonons in the system into account, you again end up with, with a kind of Maxwell Bloch system now looking somewhat more complicated than the ones before. And if you do that, then you have your simulation and then you can go and do that. Okay, so why is this important? Because experimentalists measure what is here at that side. So if you remember that picture, what they measure in a long space, moving in time. What you can do in the theory, actually what you have to do in theory, you literally have to look inside of the laser in order to see what is going on. And that insight gives you an insight into what is happening in that experimental situation. You can compare that literally to the formation of optical tornadoes. That light field interacts so strongly with the material, with that system of semiconductors, so that suddenly they focus, nonlinear processes set in, and then they form something which causes literally havoc, havoc inside of the laser. People have for many years thought, how can we actually control these? literally very difficult. Because the way that you control this is literally like if you know that there's something inside of your body that is not right, and the only thing they can do is to put on some kind of cream. You can only touch the surface, but you can't get inside. So no operation possible, because otherwise the whole laser wouldn't work anymore. How can we solve that? Nature solves it rather nicely in the case of the tornadoes. It's for example, in the U.S., if you look at that flat area, this is kind of Oklahoma, is those of you who know the U.S. a bit, here 
everything is flat, they form very quickly, and in, indeed, there's almost like a tornado season where they are. Whereas a bit further east, for example, in West Virginia, you have hills. And if you look at the prevalence of tornadoes in the US, you will hardly get any there. And if you think about the nonlinearity that causes a tornado and that, that one, that hilly structure, is the question, how can we create a hilly structure inside of a laser? And there was that new physics coming about. Because people discovered and used cavities of different shapes in order to make sure that the light travels in different ways. Why is this useful? Well, if you, for example, now create a cavity which has not this rectangular, but rather this D-shaped, there's a cavity physics out there that now describes the expectation value of the light inside of that structure. Light is reflected at the boundaries and then has certain areas where it is higher and certain areas where it is lower. And depending on all these reflections, you can see it forms a pattern inside of the laser. And this is now, it's a bit bright here, but if you look closer, this has structure. And if you look at the size of that, it has structure on a scale which is incredibly small because of that interaction in that side. And it's so small that it has, has this kind of irregular structure in there. And why is this again relevant? Because now we create our hilly structure inside of the cavity. And this hilly structure now, this is literally like for the light field, you can regard this as an atom. That's the ex expectation value of the light here, localized, if you average this over in that, in that direction. And so as a result of that, there's this stabilization happening on that front so that the light is being emitted, how it is exiting the structure over there. Okay. So we have that light interacting and exiting, exiting now. And you can see that in order to model this, we came up with a description where you would literally look at a cut along that direction and compare that laser along something which is completely flat, homo homogeneous or across that, and something which has a sub-wavelength random way how the, how the uh, kind of a rective index is distributed on that. That's again folding back to the theory and uh, here now taking into account the beauty of the semiconductor, which means that it's not two levels but rather many bands. It makes it just a little bit more complex, but the physics is very similar. And these bands now then create a so-called gain structure and refractive index change. I'm, sh I'm allowing you to look now under the hood. It's a bit like driving a car and not opening the hood. Now I'm showing you what is underneath. So if you want to understand what is, you can drive a car without knowing anything of that. You can look at the laser without knowing anything what is going on inside it. But if you want to understand the processes, if you want to model them, there's a bit of a, a, a sort of say, an op opportunity to go and look at that. And we have these different states labeled along those. It takes a while to get your head around that, but after you've done it, you can see it is similar to that more simple system, but with that different bands. Again, taking into account the fact that we now have sub-wavelength variations, we can then see, okay, we have a very, very short time pulsation exiting the structure. So these modes form, that's all nice, but why and how does it help us? If we now compare, there's now a little animation here, that irregularly randomized structure and that straight one, and now see what happens. At the beginning, this one here was stable, and this one was here, unstable. This one becomes, because of that multi-mode interaction, unstable. And that one that was irregular, after a while, gets to be regular. So we have that effect. The reason for this is now that that irregularity, this disorder, prevents the nonlinearity from actually doing its detrimental job. It prevents the formation of those tornadoes inside and thus it 
overall stabilizes the system. So indeed, here now, if I look at the time involvement, we don't have that irregular, irregular uh, oscillatory behavior anymore, but rather than the one over, over there. West Virginia and, and Oklahoma as representatives now in comparison. I'm already a little bit behind time, but I'll give you one more example, because having seen that, it's the question, what is it all good for? We used quantum chaos in order to prevent nonlinear chaos. What can we do with that? Well, there's one thing which quantum scientists always want. Actually, everyone wants, in principle. We need random numbers, random bits. Because what we need to do, we need to encrypt things. In, we, we need to do practically everything where we want to go and prevent people from doing something. And there's even a stochastic modeling out there. Yet these processes are usually performed on a computer with a certain algorithm. So if I could have, for example, a quantum computer or another computer, we could go and decrypt that. If you now would use that principle that we have a nonlinearity in there and that tornado effect in a laser structure like that, change it again and make that literally very, very many of these. We could then use that to destruct any so-called correlations, and then the light field, again a longer story, would then directly interact with the quantum fluctuations that we always experience from the vacuum. So in other words, these little light field streaks, they, are now, they don't depend on another anymore if they are kind of decoupled. They sense the quantum fluctuations directly. And that is what we then used these are the so-called correlations in space and in time. Correlations and anti-correlations, if they're gone, then the only element that interacts with the light field in there, this reflecting the material, this now reflecting the quantum fluctuations directly. So you can now use that and literally harness what nature provides us with perfect randomness, quantum randomness. And you can go and use this as a basis for, literally like that, for uh, using that and creating bit streams out of that. And these bit streams that are created, they reflect directly the quantum fluctuations that don't depend on any algorithmic dependence, but rather come from there. So there the hope is that through those, you know, we rather recently uh, showed that, we, we, we could this was in lasers, come back to the collaboration. Here the experiments being conducted at Yale, the lasers made in Singapore, and we providing the theory for that. So it was a bit of like a collaborative effect in this. And you can gamble with that. Well, you can make random numbers that you can use for, in particular, again, and there's, for me, a very nice way is how the loop almost seems to be at going back to where you are, where you can conduct simulations that rep represent the, 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 the quantum statistics that you want to go and, and model with in that. Okay, I've stretched time a bit. I've very strongly uh, kind of flew over some of the theory, but I wanted, what, what I wanted to show is, and um, again, delighted uh, that the invitation was there, that with theory and simulation, you can complement to experiment. You can explore things. You can do things that experiments experimentalists don't want to do or can't do, that's always your uh, kind of, uh, you, you're always open to do that. But you can also, in addition to that, you can interact with them, you can inspire them or be inspired by, by them. And if you do this in these three different elements, I I've hope I, I've given you a bit of an insight into, in, on why it is fun to do that, why it is insightful. And I think there's a lot of science that is ahead of us that allows us to bring that light field as a probe, as an investigator into the nanoscale, explore the quantum dynamics, but also use quantum dynamics to something which is not in incredibly immediately a quantum computer, but rather a way how these quantum processes can be used to do something else and, and different on that. Remains to me to say a big thank you for the opportunity to, to do this. And, and, and also before I I, I 
and I'd be very delighted to, to, uh, to have that. Since I here and we're heading and the way that we do this, a rather large research program, uh, I, I always say, people, we have opportunities to perform research. There's a lot of the other things. And what we have at the moment available, um, some of you have already approached me, and, but there's still further opportunities there, fully funded positions in PhDs. So you don't even have to apply for it. The money is there, the post is there. The only thing is uh, you need to go and, and uh, if you want, are, are interested in any of those, let me know. There's a few still available and I'm keen to, to go and, and, um, and um, should I say, have them started in 2022, so for next year coming up. Thanks again for the opportunity and thank you very much. The, um, I hope I got the, um, anyway. we showed that you can actually generate these random bits. There's, as always, there's technical, technical problems or technical challenges though, rather than problems. We can create random numbers in an incredibly high, and I forgot to mention, this is one of the, actually, the reasons is, they, they occur on time scales faster than any other process that was there before. And in a density higher than that. But the challenge now is to find detectors that detect that on those timescales. So this is now really the thing. Otherwise, I would be able to sell that tomorrow, or we would be able to sell that tomorrow. We can't do this yet. So it takes some challenges to add one element with another. But besides that, even a, a good random number, a good quantum random number is worth a lot. And I don't know whether the, the, uh, the question, um, I hope I caught that correctly, whether that was jumping ahead of quantum computers. Whether quantum computers would, would uh, is, it, is it like an arms race? On the one hand, I promote the use of something that encourages using a computation on the quantum scale, because with that, people could hope to crack all these security algorithms that are there. On the other hand, I want to go and make them better. So in, in, in that scale, it's, Perhaps we are similar at the moment to uh, at a stage where what quantum science is nowadays is what perhaps nuclear science was in the 60s. Novelties springing up and discoveries being made. Not that quantum physics is new, but to explore that and to work it with it, this kind of quantum technology. And now, we have to see whether we can understand these processes and can encourage them, but we also have to go and be mindful what you could do with them. It's a bit like a, in, in that. I still think that um, a full-scale quantum computer that can do everything is a while away from us in time. It's because knowing how these challenges are, and, and there's some concepts associated with so-called noisy quantum computing out there now. And, and I'm very much for exploring more quantum communication and, 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 and other elements in that, rather than building the quantum computer. The majority of the companies who at the moment build quantum computers, they all 
uh, put their eggs in the cryo basket. But one of the reasons for doing that is because the technology there works. We're just a little bit behind, but I believe that if that technology was to be successful, we need to make it work, not just in, in, in huge centers, but rather to have something like a, like a quantum portable device, perhaps, sometime. And for that, we can't have cryoprocesses working only. We need to do something else. And if we don't get to the quantum computer, we can use these quantum processes for other things. This is a bit like, um, does anyone know the Teflon effect? Uh, it was, uh, uh, Teflon effect doesn't, doesn't mean that things don't stick, but it's one of the consequences probably more lasting than the Apollo program, but developed during the Apollo program. So we're now using something that was actually made for space science. In a similar way, we are discovering processes by working towards something that can then be used also in other circumstances if we have an open mind with that. One of the things. Please. The main, the, main, the main challenge in that or, is, um, yeah, <laughs> what is it that we need? We need, what have I shown you today? Actually, it's rather modest. I've shown you one atom interacting with one field. I've shown you a little bit about the second stage where one quantum dot interacted with another one. But that's not enough. I mean, how many are you here? Close to 30, 40? I can still sense we're kind of in this mesoscopic regime where uh, you're more than a single atom, but you're not quite a stadium yet. A stadium you can describe in macroscopic variables. A single atom you describe in a single process. But this mesoscopic regime is where you have both individual elements as well as the group element coming together. That's where we need to go and, 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 and go. We need more quantum dots interacting. At the moment, these quantum processes, they have around 40 to 50. But that's a little bit where they are at. It's one of the main consequences. And, it, and, and so because even with all the proper shielding, they can't shield well enough to have all these processes still working when they have more than 50. I want to do things the other way around. I want to try to, there's another element that I didn't talk about, which is so-called topological protection. Because if you, if you, for example, design materials in a particular way, then you can enable states that have to be the way that they are. And if you have inhomogeneities in matter, they don't matter so much. So rather than suppressing noise, the principle would be to work with it. Not an easy task, but I think if you know that you're working with something dirty, building up something that works step by step, so rather than continuously suppressing noise that you can, can't eventually suppress. It's a bit like a philosophical aspect. That's why I said, I, I, I don't have a looking glass. But I'd, I, I think that it's worthwhile not just using a quantum computer, but rather go and do research on something else. To, to make it better at the same time. So it, we are, it's a very young field still. And, and there's a lot of people who, who do that. And, and maybe another comparison it is, yes, except the fact that we all have cars, we want to drive a car, but we shouldn't stop looking at better engines or better ways how to do that, which is now that transition from the combustion engine to the electric one, if we want to undertake that, or to hydrogen as an example. In some ways, we know that thing will eventually also drive in the same way as the other one drive, but we want to fundamentally change the engine that it drives. So that's perhaps a bit the philosophy. On that.
what the quantum dot is. Okay, uh, brilliant. A not at all stupid question at all. What is a quantum dot? Well, how do you make a quantum dot? Actually, why is it a quantum dot? It's because the two different things out there in my little world over here. One of them are the electrons, the ones that design or create matter, and the other thing are the light fields. The electrons, they are confined. I mean, there's this long story. But if you make that thing small enough where you contain the electrons in, the electrons don't see a three-dimensional world anymore. They only see levels, a zero-dimensional world. So suddenly, instead of having these bands that they have whenever you have a periodic lattice of nuclei with electrons in between, they now just behave as if they were a, an atom. They don't have bands anymore, but just atoms. And that's why they call quantum dots. It's a dot-like structure where the electron is. And strangely enough, if you have something like around 10 nanometers in size, the electron doesn't see any, any dimension anymore. It just is like that. For me, the, the real breakthrough, had I given a talk about quantum dots 20 years ago, I would have still looked at the light field being about 100 times larger than the quantum dot. I can now give the talk the other way around. Because what we have discovered now is that once you go sub-wavelength to the near field property of the light field, there is no end. And suddenly, because 20 years ago, people dealing with optics would have, would have been regarded as not, well, a bit of a little bit old-fashioned physics. Nowadays, since you have, through nanoplasmonic elements, through nanophotonic elements, opened up the nano world where electrons live to photons with all that interaction. So suddenly, the, the field varies on scales smaller than the electrons. So the electrons think, the electron thinks it is a zero-dimensional world, but the near field can actually explore variations. So that one of the things that I didn't go into, one of the things that we seem to be discovering is, is that actually this quantum dot is pa po polarized. That it is not just that zero-dimensional thing, but the field explores certain elements being stronger than the others. So it is very, very, uh, almost like a very fundamental physics con concept that is being the other way around. We're only starting to develop methods to explore this, theoretically. Experimentally, it's very difficult, but uh, theoretically, it is as well. Uh, you, because what you need to do is literally, you need, you can't really assume that these energ energetic levels even exist. So what you have to do, you have to solve Schrodinger's equation on the fly while solving the other thing. But we, in 10, 15 years, perhaps, we can do that. It's a bit like doing photons and materials at the same stage on that. But extremely good question. I'm sorry for assuming that everyone knows what a quantum dot is.